Morning, Pastor Tolhurst. Morning. Great to see you today. You. Have you had your hongi? Oh, not this morning yet. Well, you better. Have to have okay. <laughs> Bless you. We look forward to your message you know, today. I was, in, I was interested in watching this man blowing the hundred year old whistle. Yes. Isn't that um, marvellous? Yeah. Somebody came to me j just the other day and said, Does this man blow that with his mouth or through his nose, through his nostril? <laughs> You know, the reason he asked the question is because there, there are people in the world who blow their, their little pipes and things using the nostril as, as the source of the, 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 uh, right. the airflow. Okay. Um, I think they suck air in through the mouth and out through the nostril. Mm, mm, mm. um, it's interesting that you can make music with lots of different instruments, isn't it? And I should have brought my dinger, didgeridoo, didgeridoo with me. Yes, I'd like to see you how you do. Because do you? I can play a didgeridoo. Yeah. Right. I've got two of them, both made by Aboriginals. And you know the Aboriginals, you know what a didgeridoo is, don't you? Most of you? You don't. Always, some don't. It's a long stick, it's a hollow stick, see? Like um, a friend of mine uh, cut down a hundred trees um, looking for the right kind of tree, small trees, before he found a, a stick that made a, a lovely, uh, a didgeridoo with a lovely tone. You know, they have different tones depending on the thickness of the wood and, and the size of the chambers in the, in the hollow. And, um, and that's how the Aboriginals do it. They cut down small trees until they find one that's been eaten out on the inside by, by termites, you see, because they didn't have any way of hollowing out a long stick. Uh, the termites do it for them. And then they just get a, another stick and poke out the broken bits and the chewed bits of wood until it's hollow and clean inside. <coughs> and this man found one after a hundred different trees that had the right tone, see. And then he uh, blows it. And they have a, a system called circular breathing so that when you blow a didgeridoo, you can keep the sound going indefinitely. You know, go for 20 minutes without taking a breath. I mean, that's what it looks like, because the sound never stops, even for a breath to be sucked in. And the, the way they do it is like the bagpipes here. See, the fellow's blowing into a bagpipe, yes. and keeps blowing into the bagpipe, and squeezing the bag, bagpipe to get the air through the, the sound tubes. Yes. Well, you see, in, in playing a didgeridoo, your cheeks are the bagpipe, are the bag, and so you wet your cheeks all blown out like this. Hmm? Hmm? And as you collapse your cheeks into the, into the uh, didgeridoo, you suck air in through your nose while your cheeks are blowing the air out as they collapse, see? And just the way this fellow right. squeezes the bag on the bag pipes, so squeezes air into the sound pipes mm -hmm. while he's blowing into the bag. Sure. And so they collapse their cheeks. Hmm? Hmm? And as you do that, the air's going out into the pipe. And the same time as their cheeks are being collapsed, they're able to suck air into their lungs. And then they keep the air flowing until their cheeks bulge out again and it's going into the pipe at the same time. Yes. And then they collapse their cheeks again while they suck air in through the nose. And that's called so circular breathing. And that's the hardest part of blowing a, a, a didgeridoo. Yes. Of course, they only play one note. You know that, don't you? I mean, everybody else is looking for the right note, but they've found it. Right. <laughs> And they can mimic a multitude of animals, oh, I Yeah, well, that's done verbally, see. The, the, the <laughs> sound is made with the air. You didn't need to bring pipe. a didgeridoo. You just, you've got it there. You can do it, yeah. Mobile. You can do it with a, with a vacuum cleaner pipe, you know. Um, you okay, can. who's got a vacuum cleaner pipe? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the sounds of the dingo and the, and the other noises that you hear are vocalisations at the same time as you're blowing. So you can be blown with, you, with the air from your lungs and vocalising too. So you go... <laughs> See? And I'm blowing all the time that I make those noises. And so they can make these other sounds come through with the <laughs> sound at the same time. Wonderful, isn't it? Right. Hey, I never get, meant to give a lesson on... No, that's all right. No, that's marvellous. Sounds like ideal training for an evangelist. <laughs> 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 but I wanted to, what I wanted to tell my friend is that, that our, our friend here who blows on this, this whistle does not use his nose, he's got it in his mouth and he's blowing from his mouth, okay <laughs> oh dear you know that uh, I'm a my, my hobby is nature photography um, I, I love nature photography and I have thousands of pictures and if they'd given me some evening meetings at this camp I would have shown you some pictures but we can do that another time perhaps um, it, you know even though nature photography is my hobby I do sometimes include people in my pictures 
that's my wife's beef. She, she says, you're taking pictures of birds and, and uh, creatures all the time and insects, but uh, you never take any pictures of, it, of our grandchildren. <laughs> that's not quite true. I do um, sometimes. But my, one of my favorite pictures, one of my favorites, is a picture of a big hand, you know, a big man's hand with a tiny newborn baby's hand laying in, in the, the, the uh, big hand. You've seen that, haven't you? Some, something like that you've seen? That's one of my favorite pictures. You know, hands are wonderful things, aren't they? We all have hands, or most of us, I guess, have got hands. I saw a man once who had, had both his hands blown off in a, 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 an explosion. And he was trying to make do with hooks in, in, that had been fastened to his arms in place of his hands. And, of course, it, it limited his abilities greatly. Uh, I saw a child who was born with only one hand, and instead of a hand on this side, only just a stump of an arm. See, I've seen numbers of those. And it's led me to appreciate the, the gift, the ability, the gift of hands and the ability to use hands in the uh, activities of life. I saw a little boy walking along with his hand in his father's hand here on the campground. And as I watched, I, uh, I, I realized afresh that that little child was perfectly safe as long as he had his hand clasped in his father's hand. I mean, there are roots growing up, aren't there? Some of you have seen them, roots growing up right along the surface, and they come above the grass in places, and if you stub your toe on that, you could go flat on your face, especially a little child who, whose um, walking abilities have not developed as much as those of older people. But as long as that little child has his hand firmly clasped in his father's hand, he can stumble all you like, but he doesn't fall because he's safe. Something special about hands, isn't there? We touch with our hands, we hold with our hands, we caress with our hands, we greet people with a handshake, we teach our little ones to pray with their hands put together like this. Something special about hands. You know, it's also true that hands are really a symbol of strength and protection and care, aren't they? I find that so. And it's also true of the hands of God. The Bible makes it very clear that God's hands are something special. In the Psalms, Psalm 102, verse 25, we read, The heavens are the work of thy hands. Moses wrote in Exodus chapter 18, no, chapter 13 and verse 3, By strength of hand, the Lord brought you out of Egyptian bondage. And in Psalm 145, verses 15, 16, the text tells us that God opens his hands and he satisfies the needs of his people. Over 200 times the Bible speaks of God's hands, guiding, protecting, supplying our needs, caring for his people. It is significant, I feel, that um, uh, the hands of Jesus became the symbol of the struggle over the plan of salvation. I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but uh, these hands that had fashioned this world, the hands of Jesus, that had fashioned this world and, and made everything that's in it, those hands that had brought healing to the multitudes, that had been extended in blessing to the crowds of people so many times during his earthly ministry, if only the devil could tie the hands of Jesus. That's an expression we have, isn't it? Tie his hands, it means limit his ability to do what he has been doing. If only the devil could tie the hands of Jesus. That, that's what he wanted to do. And so he took those hands and he had them nailed to the cross. Think about it in this sense. You know the story of Calvary. As Jesus hung there with his hands held back from the people by uh, steel pins... He looked for support and comfort. Surely his disciples would give him the support and comfort that he needed, for after all, he had been with them for three and a half years and they'd become close friends of his. They understood his mission, to a large degree at least. And surely he could depend on his disciples, but as is often the case, particularly in situations of leadership, when he needed them the most, they weren't there. They deserted him and fled. Sad, wasn't it? The irony of the situation, of course, is 
The Bible tells us that it was one of his closest followers who betrayed him. And do you know what the rest of that text says? Betrayed him into the hands of sinners. So you've got this hands business again. It's right there. That Judas betrayed Jesus into the hands of sinners. With no support from his disciples, to whom then could he turn in his hour of greatest need? He couldn't turn to the Jews because they'd clamoured for his crucifixion. He couldn't turn to the Romans because even though they ruled the Palestine at that time, it was the Romans who took and cr crucified him, who nailed him to the cross. So in that crisis situation, there was no human help forthcoming, and so he must then turn to his Father God. It was the only direction he could turn. Where else? Jesus turned to his Father God. And I want you to follow closely with me now because this is where the drama becomes particularly significant, particularly interesting. You see, we're told that darkness enveloped the earth at that time. I want to read to you from uh, Ellen White. She said, No eye could pierce the gloom that surrounded the cross. No eye. You see, worse than that, it gets much worse. She goes on to say, None could penetrate the deeper gloom that enshrouded the suffering soul of Christ. They couldn't see him, see. Mercifully, Jesus was hidden from their gaze in this dramatic time. They could only hear his voice. And what did they hear? What were the words they heard? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, the last possible place he could turn was to his father. And in this dramatic moment, Jesus cries out to his father, Why hast thou, of all beings? No, he expected the Jews to, to forsake him. He expected the Roman, he, the, the disciples. But, but his father, that was something else. Why hast thou forsaken me? Now, where could Jesus turn now? with no human or divine help. This was a crisis. I tell you it was a crisis. There was impending disaster here. Supposing he came down off the cross, which he could well have done, without any support from any being, he could have come down off the cross and said, I've had enough of this, I can't handle it anymore. I can't go through with this. And if Jesus had come down off the cross, there'd have been no salvation. You and I would have been without hope in the world. The Bible makes that very clear. No hope whatsoever. The whole plan of salvation aborted. But then we hear a sound. The silence is broken. Not by the sound of nails being wrenched out of wood. But it's a whisper from the central cross. And what are the words? Father. Father. Into thy hand. Into thy hands, not the hands of men, not the hands of the disciples, not the hands of angels, even. Into thy hands, Father, I commit my spirit. You know, the drama of that moment is something that we need to reflect upon. I think we do well to reflect upon it. For inspiration has told us that in his anguish, Jesus could not see beyond the grave. Were you aware of that fact? If you haven't read the writings of Ellen White on this subject, Great uh, Desire of Ages and some of those other writings, you may not be aware of this, but she tells us that in his anguish, Jesus could not see beyond the grave. I read from Desire of Ages, page 753. The Saviour could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the tomb a, con a conqueror or tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. You know, I've tried to imagine what went through God's mind at that time. <clears throat> what went through Jesus' mind at that time? As he hung there on the cross, 
feeling that his father had forsaken him, uh, not able to see through the portals of the tomb. Oh, we know that during his earthly ministry, he spoke of his resurrection, didn't he? He said to his disciples, you destroy this temple, and in three days again, I'll raise it up. And, and he said to the thief on the cross, thou shalt be with me in paradise. But now, as darkness enveloped the, the hill of Calvary, and, and Jesus felt the weight of the world's sin, it seemed so offensive to God that their separation, it seemed, he feared, was to be eternal. Maybe it would take more than his death to redeem mankind. Maybe that's the thought that went through his mind at this time. So I've thought about it. Maybe he would never see his father's face again. Do you hear what I'm saying here? As Jesus hung on the cross, he was afraid that... It, this, this was to be an eternal separation from his father. Now that's a much bigger cost than just dying, knowing very well you're going to rise again. Tremendous cost. You see, the truth is that he knew that the father, because of his love for us, would do anything at all, anything, whatever was needed to complete the redemption process. And if that meant the eternal separation of Jesus from his father, Jesus was willing. Into thy hands, Father, whatever it costs, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't it? You know, it, it was for you and for me that Jesus was willing to go into eternal death, never see his father's face again. I can't comprehend that. It's just too much for me to understand. But I rejoice in it. <laughs> I rejoice that he, was, he loved us so much he was willing to go that far. And I rejoice also that Jesus demonstrated as an example to you and me what perfect trust in his Father is like. Perfect trust. Into thy hands, Father, I commit my spirit. Of course, in a sense, there was nothing new about that attitude. You know, Jesus always submitted to his Father's will. He knew he could trust him, for they'd been together throughout eternity. And to the Jews, he once said, I came not to do mine own will, but what? The will of him that sent me. <laughs> See, that was Jesus' mission on earth. Do the will of his Father. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Not my will, Father, but thine be done. And so we have here the, the, uh, the attitude Jesus had toward this whole business, redeeming mankind. And, and at last, as he hung there on the cross and prayed, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. We know now that Jesus meant exactly what he said. He loved us supremely. I'd like you to reflect for a few moments on this trust that Jesus placed in his Father. Was it well trust? Uh, well placed? Was it well placed? Uh, did God prove to be trustworthy in his relation with Christ at this time? You know, the answer to that question is important because um, the, the answer that you... you give or find to that question um, will affect your relationship with the Father God yourself. You see, the Bible says that the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. See, the first part of that text says you, if you put your trust in men, that'll let you down. I guess every one of you, if I would ask you to raise your hand and indicate could it think of some experience in your life where you've put your trust in a fellow human being and they've let you down. You know, I've, I've talked with people. I know a number of people who were Adventists once. But because an Adventist let them down in business dealings or some other way, they lost their faith and they've gone out of the church, no longer followed Jesus. That's sad, isn't it? You know, um, they've given up on God 
because they were let down by their fellow man. I don't think that's anything like it. I'd say it's hardly fair with God. It's hardly playing fair with God to take it out on God when, a, when one of your fellow men lets you down, regardless of what his profession is. You know. We need to keep our trust in him, not in our fellow man. It's nice to be able to trust your fellow man. We've all got friends and we, we trust implicitly, but sometimes we can be disappointed by even those whom we trust so dearly. And so we need to learn to trust our God implicitly, for that's what the text says. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Well, now we know that this faithfulness of God, that this trust that Jesus put in his Father worked out well for Jesus because in Matthew 28, the Bible tells us on the third day following his crucifixion that God sent an angel down to, to earth with the commission, bring my son back to me. He has redeemed mankind. The victory is ours and I want him back home. And I can imagine the rejoicing in heaven as the angels heard this directive that God gave to one of his angels. Go on down there and roll back the stone and call Jesus to life. And so by the power of the Almighty, divinity was awakened in Jesus and he came back to life. So you see, God proved to be faithful after all in this whole relationship. He didn't let Jesus down. He called him forth to life. No wonder the prophet Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, I think it's chapter 3, 22, 23, says, Great is thy faithfulness. We have a, a hymn that goes that way, haven't we? Great is thy faithfulness. Wonderful hymn. I love it. It's one of my favorites. I could tell you stories about that. We probably haven't time to do that this morning. You know, Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, that it is the same exceeding great power that raised Christ from the dead that is available to you and to me. It's life-giving power. It's resurrection power. I heard a woman give a testimony this morning on this very point. I don't know who she was, but she came forward here to this microphone in the early morning meeting, and she gave a testimony to the effect that it is the mighty power, the life-giving power, the resurrection power that, that uh, called Jesus back to life from the grave that is available to you and to me. It's in there in Ephesians chapter, chapter 1. Wonderful promise. Verses 19 and 20. It's an amazing truth and we do well to reflect on that too. And what it means is that you and I need never doubt the divine power that is available to you and to me as children of God for whatever purpose, whatever purpose, whether it's forgiveness of sin or whether it's victory over sin, whether it's the, the courage to witness for Christ, uh, whatever it is, sacrifice for him. You know, I think the missionaries must uh, put this text into effect tremendously. We have some wonderful stories we could tell of missionaries, how they have sacrificed Wonderful stories. You know, there was a missionary family in, in Guam recently, one of the islands in Guam, in, the, in that whole area. Palau is the name of the island. You heard about that, didn't you? Where a missionary family of ours, the... Uh, De Pin uh, what was their name? That doesn't matter. It's a Spanish name. It just slips my mind at the moment. But uh, these people, uh, a man and his wife, and their 11-year-old boy were all clubbed to death on Palau. And uh, at the funeral service for those people, there was a 10-year-old girl who was taken by the uh, assailant and um, he, she was wrapped up in a blanket and thrown over a cliff. But she survived. And she's the only surviving member of the family. And when the mother of that uh, missionary husband came to the funeral, uh, she stood up behind the microphone and... She said, I, I, you know, it's a sad thing. We, we've lost a son and his family. But she said, I want you to know that the mother of the assailant has also lost a son. You see, he'll probably get the death penalty for it. And she called that mother up onto the platform. And there the two of them embraced each other. And she said, I, I, I don't hold it against you or your family, for what happened to my family. I forgive 
him and all of you in the, in the love of Jesus Christ. And that little 10-year-old girl gave her testimony that when she wanted to stay in, in Palau, and they said, no, you mustn't, you've got to go back now to, with family back to America. But uh, she said, well, when I grow up, I want to go back to Palau as a missionary. <laughs> it's a beautiful spirit, isn't it? Beautiful spirit. I think of a, a family by the name of Anderson who were missionaries in Tanzania. And one night, five thugs, five men broke into that home, tied up the husband, and then gang raped his wife and their 12-year-old daughter repeatedly. We flew them back to America, of course. I mean, you, you're afraid of AIDS infection with that kind of men. And uh, we flew them back to America where they could get medical attention quickly because if you can get the medical attention within so many hours, then it prevents them from, hopefully, from contracting AIDS. Do you know that when those medical treatments were over, that family went right back to Tanzania to serve as missionaries still? You know, some of us would have packed up and headed for home, wouldn't we? But... Uh, this text, I think, is probably their source of strength, the exceeding great power that raised Christ from the grave. That power is available to us to help us in our own struggle against the temptations of evil and to give us courage to serve Christ wherever he calls us, do whatever is called and asked of us. He's reaching out to us, you see. He's able to save to the uttermost those that come unto God by him. So the theme then of this little talk that's not very long and we'll probably finish early is into thy hands. The hands of our heavenly father, we as his children, members of the heavenly family, the family of God, sons and daughters of God, can trust him. That's the point. We can trust him. Scripture and experience testify that we too can safely commit ourselves into God's hands. Over and over again in the Bible, he proves to be trustworthy. You know, the Bible speaks of him as a righteous God. And uh, we heard in the first meeting, I think, that Elder Paulian uh, brought to us that he is a righteous God. And uh, we, he, he asked us, what does, does the word righteousness mean? Do you remember what uh, the, the definition of righteousness turned out to be in, in his talk? Right doing. Yes, right doing. You know, as a, as a child, I grew up thinking of righteousness as, as obedience to the commandments of God. And that would seem to me to have been righteousness if I was fully obedient to the commandments of God. Well, now, what is it that, uh, that qualifies God to be called a righteous God? Is it that he is obedient to his commandments? I mean, I, I hardly think, I mean, perhaps I, I give the wrong impression if I say I hardly think so. It, that's not what I really mean. What I mean is the commandments are the demonstration of his character. So that is what God is like. But I don't believe that's the reason why he's spoken of in Scripture as a righteous God. Do you know why it is? He's spoken of in Scripture as a righteous God because he is faithful to his people. He's faithful to the promises that he has made to his people, to the provision of eternal life, salvation that he has made to his people. Over and over again, God is revealed in Scripture as being faithful to his people. He keeps his promises. He defends his people. He rescues them from the enemy. He's always there. And if you want stories and illustrations of that, you simply open the Bible and it falls open to them, one after the other. He delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage. Therein he demonstrated his faithfulness to his people. He rolled back the Red Sea. He caused the sun to stand still while Joshua defeated the five kings. He caused the walls of Jericho to fall flat. He fed Elijah by a raven with food that was dropped from time to time, a little bubbling brook. He multiplied the oil and the meal of the widow of Zarephath. See. He rescued Jonah by me means of a whale. He uh, shut the lion's mouths while Daniel was in the lion's den. He prayed for Peter 
that Peter's faith would fail not. He sent encouragement to John in prison before John was beheaded. You say, how was, how was that in terms of this concept of God's faithfulness? To allow John to be beheaded? But you see, he sent encouragement to him first because he knew that in his death, John would achieve much more than possibly he could achieve in his life. In every case that you read about in the Bible, God revealed himself as a righteous God. And that's the kind of God he is, totally trustworthy and absolutely faithful. You know, Jesus reflects that righteousness, that faithfulness. And I recall that he prayed for us. And that's a wonderful thing because uh, sometimes you pray for me and, and I pray for you. And that, that's good too. That's wonderful. But Jesus prayed for you. And do you remember what he said when he prayed for you? He said to his father, Father, please, will you keep them? I want, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world, he said to his father, but I'm asking you to keep them from the evil that's in this world. That's how Jesus prayed for us. And uh, he fulfills his promise. I tell you, God can hardly resist the prayer of Jesus that he prays for us. And the Bible says that God holds us. Listen to this. Are you listening? The Bible says that God, God holds us in his hands. <laughs> That's a beautiful thought. Turn with me, would you, to John chapter, what is it, chapter 10? John chapter 10. I want to read two or three verses here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 10. And we'll read verse 27 first and on through to 29. Jesus here says in verse 27, John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now that's Jesus speaking, see. And he says, nobody will be able to pluck you out of my hand, Jesus says. But that's not all, it gets better. Verse 30 I and my Father are one. I'm sorry, verse 29. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So here Jesus said, nobody can pluck you out of his own hands and nobody can pluck you out of his Father's hands. And that gives me the picture of a little child walking along with mother and father, one on each side. And he's got his hand in his Father's here and he's got his hand in his mother's hand here and with two hands being held safely. There's no way that child can stumble and fall. No way at all. And we have that promise in the spiritual sense from our Heavenly Father and from Jesus himself. I, I, th I think that's beautiful. You see, when you, when you stop and think of it, if we have committed ourselves into God's care, it doesn't really matter what happens to us in this world. It's all right. It doesn't really matter whether health or sickness, prosperity or adversity, accolades or false accusation, okay, freedom or imprisonment, even death itself. It doesn't really matter what happens to us in this life if we safely have committed ourselves into God's hands. It's all right. Now, that's not an easy thing to get hold of and accept, is it? But it's the truth. It's a wonderful truth. It was Job who, having endured many of these privations and losses, you know, he lost his family, his possessions, the support of his wife, his friends, all of that. He lost a lot and he was reduced to boils terrible boils, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. And his wife said, why don't you curse God and die? The ultimate discouragement. But what did he say? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's the ultimate pinnacle of trust. Even if God chooses to slay me. So God is perfect. And you know, 
He's perfectly trustworthy. When I was in the Philippines, I told you the other day about uh, prison ministries and how I preached in one of the prisons in the Philippines. And I remember in that prison where the, uh, the treasurer was, was a man who had, had killed, you know, he was the man who had served 20 years or 22 years of a 42 year uh, sentence and, and the head elder was a man who had killed 32 people. That uh, head elder, as a little boy, had seen the political leaders of the country massacre his family because they wanted their property. And there were 32 of his family killed. His parents, his brothers, his sisters, his uncles, his aunts, his nephews, his, his uh, cousins rather. 32 of them killed. Because the leaders of the country at the time, or of the district, I'm not sure which it was, but the leaders had uh, <coughs> wanted, wanted their property. They had a very nice piece of land. And he, he escaped somehow, this one boy, and he vowed that when he grew up, he would get revenge. And he did. He killed 32 people in revenge of that family that had taken their property. And they caught him and they put him into prison. When I was preaching, there was a man sitting down there um, on the right-hand side of the center aisle, just on my right it was, and he was in the second front seat. And I have to tell you, I have never seen a man with such a, a satanic-looking face in my life. He, he was a hardened criminal, obviously. Lived a whole life of crime. And, and uh, I guess he, what goes with crime, of course, is a, is a, an unhealthy lifestyle and so forth. But, but his face was lined with with creases and, you know, this savage-looking snarl on his face as he sat there in the church, in the Adventist church within the prison walls. And uh, I, I decided that I would preach directly to him. And I preached this message, much of this anyhow, similar to this, what I'm telling you today. And as I preached, I talked to that man. I looked straight at him, because I like to look at people into people's faces while I'm speaking, and I... I feel as though I'm being listened to if, if I got their attention for a few minutes. <laughs> and then I look to somebody else. And I look at them for a little while, see. And so I looked at this man straight up into his eyes as I talked like this. And I told him, it doesn't matter if you place your life into the hands of God. It doesn't really matter what happens to you. Freedom or imprisonment. doesn't matter. Because you're safe in the hands of God. And as I made my appeal, I have to tell you that that man's face began to change. And in place of the scowl, there came a... Uh, I don't know if he knew how to smile, but I interpreted it as a smile. As his face softened, and finally he nodded his head. As he, as he did his best to smile. See, the gospel makes a difference, doesn't it? When people understand what it means to trust God, to place their hands, their, their lives into the hands of God, it makes a big difference to the way you look on life and how you go about life. And that's the way it was with this, this dear prisoner, incarcerated probably for the rest of his life, but able to understand the, the truth of the gospel. Only God is perfectly trustworthy. You can trust him, and he will never let you down. The story of the cross is your guarantee. So ever keep that before you. Into thy hands, Father, I commend my spirit. Psalm 91, verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. In him will I trust. And so he invites you this morning to enter into a closer trust relationship with him. And incidentally, next time you see a little boy walking along with his hand firmly clasped in his father's, you'll remember what I've said this morning. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we are so grateful that uh, you have given to us such encouragement 
and that we can trust you, that it's all right, no matter what happens to us in this life, because there is a glorious future awaiting for the family of God. Bless every one of us to this end, and as we approach the Sabbath of this great camp, we pray that your spirit will move amongst us and prepare us for a rich blessing as the climax of camp comes round and strengthen us for the days, the weeks and the months that lie ahead. We ask in Jesus' name.